My name is Lindsay Hagee, and you should consider open source software because we can move science forward faster when we work together. Welcome to SEG Seismic Sound Off, conversations addressing the challenges of energy, water, and climate. I'm your host, Andrew Gary. In this episode, Dr. Lindsay Hagee discusses February's special section in the leading edge on the future of applied geophysics. Lindsay and I explore open source software and its possibilities to transform the geosciences. Lindsay shares our insights on the power of open source software to democratize science, allowing a broader community to engage in problem solving and innovation. She explains the nuances of open source licensing and its implications for collaboration and commercialization. We also get an inside look at the creation and impact of SIMPEG, an open source framework for geophysical inversions, which has become a sandbox for researchers to plug in new ideas without reinventing the wheel. This episode is a treasure trove for anyone interested in the intersection of technology, education, and research. Lindsay highlights how tools developed for teaching can lead to new research insights and how the open source movement is redefining the value of scientific contributions. Please check out the show notes to find all the valuable links referenced in this conversation, plus to read Lindsay's biography. And now, let's get to my conversation with Lindsay Hagee. I get excited when I see a, a special section in the leading edge that's a little bit more open-ended as opposed to super, not that this is not technical, but that is a little touching on different aspects of applied geophysics. And the title of this special section of February is The Future of Applied Geophysics. Why do you think pausing and taking a more holistic view of geophysics is a valuable thing to do? I mean, I think it's a, a thing that's important to do in a field. It's important to do in your career periodically is, you know, like take a step back, take a moment to reflect, examine where we're focusing efforts and where we, you know, where we think priorities are and actually take a step back and ask, is this where we should be focusing efforts? Is this where priorities should be? And especially thinking about the problems, you know, going forwards. I think right now we're in a really important and interesting time where we're seeing you know, the types of questions that geoscientists are are being brought into and are being asked to help pursue are changing. You know, we're, we're hopefully shifting off of a hydrocarbon based economy. And that means we need different resources. There's different stresses coming with climate change, for example, you know, groundwater, changing coastal climates and, and coastal communities, things like permafrost melting, all of these things are impacting communities. And there's spaces where geoscientists have knowledge and, and know how to contribute and so being able to to do this right now, I think, is is extremely timely. I, I haven't heard that term hydrocarbon based economy. And I kind of like that as a marker of maybe a transitioning time. When you had this pause and, and even looking across the papers in the special section, what were some kind of exciting areas that you see or opportunities to innovate for applied geophysics? I think we're in a really exciting time. There's so much high quality data and more and more of that data is being made publicly available. Um, so, you know, who can participate in science and start to pick up these data and, and play with new ideas, I think is, is a really important shift that that's, you know, broadening to, to more and more people. But especially too, I think we see so many important and interesting questions where geophysics can contribute. So our group has traditionally been involved a lot with minerals, and that's increasingly, you know, important. As I mentioned, groundwater, impacts of climate change urban geophysics. And so there's all of these spaces where, you know, earth science intersects with society. And now we have data and instrumentation where we can actually really bring something to the table, you know, with real-time monitoring, with being able to, you know, stream data different places, also with the tools that we have for processing data. So inversions, machine learning, and, and all of that, there's big opportunities to be bringing in different data sets together to answer some really tangible uh, questions that, that really intersect with, you know, how we live our lives. That's a, a perfect lead into what you wrote about it in the, in the leading edge around open source software and also open science, which we'll explore a little bit later. But let's kind of start to make sure we're all on the same page. How do you go about in your mind of defining what is open source software? 
Yeah, so there's a few layers to it. I think, you know, starting at the base, um, open source software is defined by the license that software is licensed under, meaning that other people need to be able to pick up and use that software and have no restrictions on who is able to use that software, what it can be used for. That's sort of the baseline of what um, an open source license is. But I think also, so the baseline is it needs to be shared with an open license. Um, but from there, there's different flavors. And so that can include, you know, sharing code just as a part of your paper. And it's a timestamp. Here's here's what you need to reproduce my work. You can have sort of projects that you're continuing to develop, or you can sort of think about these full-blown, you know, community-driven open source software packages. And so by that meaning that it's beyond sharing code, you need practices in place to have multiple people collaborating from different institutions in different places in the, around the world. So there's, there's this whole spectrum of, you know, where and how people can contribute to open source software. It can be first from just like, I write some code to do something interesting in my paper and share that. And that's a, a very valuable thing to do. Going to, you know, these larger projects, those also have a ton of value. And so it's just a question of like, you know, what's what's the purpose and what are you trying to to drive forward? Yeah, it's kind of nice how you can just simply contribute an open source software or you could use it or there is a lot of ways to participate. I know when I worked on the SDG wiki, which was a part of the media wiki, most people know Wikipedia, I always found it very strange how people really had a hard time understanding that this is the license of the SDG wiki. And if you use this, you have to continue using this license, basically meaning you have to continue to let other people use it and repurpose it. Do you still find that when you're talking about open source software, a difficult thing for un for people to understand? Or what are you finding the most difficult thing that people have grasping when you're discussing open source software? Yeah, so there's there's a few different things. I'll start by touching on one piece uh, that you mentioned here with respect to, you know, how is somebody allowed to use a software or, you know, a scientific artifact? So there's broadly like, and the licensing terms, I think is something that's actually really important for somebody to understand as you're getting familiar with open source software. So broadly speaking, there's two flavors of licenses. There are permissive licenses. So some common ones that you'd hear of are like the MIT license, the BSD license. What those are is you're anybody in the world is allowed to pick up and use that software, adapt it for any purpose, uh, commercial or open source as long as it is referenced. And so for example, a software that is licensed with an MIT license, you could actually pick up that software and incorporate parts of that into a commercial software package. And as long as it's referenced, you're you're totally in the clear and that's, that's something that you're welcome to do. The other flavor are copy left licenses. And those, um, a common one you hear is uh, the GNU uh, GPL license. And those are in a sense, they, force open source whenever you use them. And so if you have a GPL licensed software, anything that you build upon with that must also remain open source. And so both of those license categories are classified as open source, but they have very different implications for what you can do with them and what sorts of communities can engage with the projects and, and how you engage with those projects. So let's look a little bit at what you all started, Simpeg. What were your motivating factors to start start Simpeg? Um, yeah, so great question. So I'm the one um, who gets to speak with you today, but I'm certainly not the only person who was involved in starting here. So uh, two key people are uh, Rowan Cockett and Soggy Kang. And so Rowan uh, was really the initial driving force and sort of brought us together, um, you know, wanting to work together. We we're working on our PhDs at the time at UBC, all related to computational geophysics and inversions. Rowan, I remember some of the first things he did was actually sending around code for us to uh, help test our code in a course assignment. And so there was just this first sort of initial collaborative effort of like, hey, we can actually be working together on some of these pieces. Part of the motivation for Simpeg is really we saw, you know, an opportunity to be working together. And these are good people who I enjoy working with. And so being able to have, you know, something tangible we could be working on was was a component. Being able to actually work through and learn some of the fundamentals of inversion, I think that there's no way to learn a concept like having to write code. And so, you know, it, you need to be able to, you know, take your ideas, actually write them down on paper and translate them to code and, and test that. And if you can successfully get through that chain, you know, you, you've understood and perhaps learned something. And so learning things about inversions is one piece, but a really big piece was also trying to see, you know, 
can we take this opportunity to do something that's perhaps a bit bigger than ourselves? Um, is that we saw in the research group and, and sort of this pattern repeating around uh, our community where, you know, a graduate student comes in, wants to pick up and, and run with a new idea. But if you've got sort of a code base that's proprietary that you're starting from, even if it's well-written code, it's hard to go in and, and tinker with a new idea. Um, and so what we really wanted to be able to do is build, you know, the toolbox that we, we wish we had when we initially started the PhD is to say, okay, if we could re-envision and sort of reimagine what the, the framework is for inverse problems and have that actually be components that you as a researcher can like pick up and say, okay, this stuff people have already solved. Like Maxwell's equations, it's kind of complicated to solve them in 3D, but like it's a solved problem. You're not going to get a PhD for writing out and, and solving Maxwell's equations. There's still star. There's still some like really interesting questions um, and, and work to be done in that space. But you know, the, the basics of just being able to get up and running sort of with the standard code in 3D, it's complex, but, you know, our, our, the community has well-established practices for, for doing that. And so if you want to be able to pick up those ideas from EM geophysics and do something new, uh, you don't want to have to start by, you know, first investing years in rewriting a 3D code so that you can then actually start to implement your ideas. And so we wanted to really provide this this toolbox and this modular space where you can take your technology that's that's been established and, and plug in your new ideas and you know really have a, a sandbox that you can you can play in. When utilizing Simpeg, has a use case arisen that got you to think differently about a problem? Yes, this is a, a great question, and I'm really pleased you asked this. the The immediate thing that came to mind is actually. I've learned a lot seeing how education, humanitarian efforts, and research all intersect in some really interesting ways. And so I'll start with like, I don't know, what we, perhaps if we simplify the world, what we think of like how you get to an educational resource is like somebody does some research, we capture the research in papers, you know, we then figure out how we're going to teach that in classes and so that includes, you know, building up lectures and, and textbooks and, and things like that. So as always, we think of it as this train from like research first through to education. But one of the things that's been um, really fun to see is that so we were involved in the um, 2017 um, SEG Distinguished Instructor Short Course, so the DISC on um, geophysical electromagnetics that was led by Doug Oldenburg and then uh, Sagi Kang and myself were involved. And as a part of that, we used SIMPEG a lot to, you know, generate figures that show some of the fundamental aspects of the physics. So being able to plot like a time domainium experiment and look at the currents through time and actually like make little movies that, you know, explain some of these these concepts that you see written down in equations. But it's it's so cool when you can actually, you know, play with the physics and, you know, go and change a couple of parameters, change the conductivity of a layer and see how that changes the currents and the magnetic fields and and these impacts, like it's it's so visual when you get a chance to explore that way. And so being able to build up some of these visualizations and these widgets, we plugged in new things to SimPeg, like the ability to visualize currents, charges, fields, and, and fluxes. But that has actually fed back into research in some really interesting ways. So for example, in some of my work, I've spent a fair bit of time looking at EM in settings where we have steel casings. So if we're doing carbon capture and storage or, or wastewater injection, anything like that, you might want to use EM because if we're injecting fluids, that often changes the subsurface conductivity. But steel is very, very conductive. It is also uh, magnetic. And so there's kind of just questions of like, how does the physics of this work? And so taking all of these tools that we built in this space of education, we spent a lot of time just looking at what the currents are doing, what the magnetic fields are doing, where are the charges? And that really let us explore that problem in, in a new way. But the, the tools started with, you know, let's, let's think about teaching this to somebody else. And then you realize, oh yeah, no, these tools that we developed for teaching are actually also useful for teaching ourselves about a problem and, and learning some things and gaining some insights there. I love this idea you talked about of, of that feedback loop or discovering a new problem to tackle or just a new direction to go when all of these different people are trying to solve different problems, but using the same code base. 
On, on the other side that you talked about industry, what do you think is the strongest business case for for-profit business for using open source software projects in their own, like in-house that they, they would then obviously share? Do you think there's, do you think there's like an ideal company for utilizing open access software that could then be used to further these problems that you're solving? Yeah, I mean, so there's a number of um, companies who are involved in contributing to Simpeg, um, in supporting research groups who contribute to Simpeg, and um, it's been really encouraging to see a shift in perspective. You know, in a, a lot of the research uh, at UBC in the past has been funded by producing proprietary codes, and so this is a real sort of shift in in our research business model in a sense. But I think one of the most powerful pieces that I see is that. By shifting the uh, shifting to open source, we're choosing the the value proposition is the people. Yes, lines of code are complex, and there is value in that. But really, it's the people who are involved in the community, the people who know how to drive the code, the people who can adapt and be able to use these tools to solve your problems. And I think what's so cool about an open source project, and when we can create healthy spaces for researchers and industry and educators to interact, you can really leverage the knowledge of that entire community. Whereas if you're talking about, you know, in-house wanting to create a single software package, you can only tap into the the people that you have access to and the people you've hired to to work on that. And that can be appropriate for for some problems. If if your core technology is really something that, you know, really is tech based and, and that's what you need to commercialize. Then, then fair enough. I mean, maybe that's open source isn't the right space for that. But I think where it really is valuable is where we're doing science, <laughs> where we need transparency around pieces, where we can and want to leverage, you know, the value um, and knowledge of a community and where the problems are, you know, bigger and, and more challenging than what, you know, a, a single individual person can solve is we, we really can learn a lot from being involved and, and supporting these communities. I think the open source community has come a long way from seven years ago when you, you did the disk talk uh, to where you are now. And there's a lot more awareness of these terms and, and with data becoming more and more available as changing things. What do you see as the next evolution as you look ahead to the next few years? That's a great question. And I think that there's so much, there's a lot of momentum building in a lot of different spaces, which is really cool. So we see open source software. We're seeing, you know, more and more um, emphasis on open data and FAIR principles. Um, so if you've heard the FAIR term, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, and I think that's a, a nice sort of acronym that applies both to data, to software, but also we we'll, we hear sort of this push towards open science. And so I think that that is, in a lot of ways, where we need to be heading. And what we mean by that is, you know, taking a lot of these these principles of openness, of accessibility, of being able to reuse content and adapt. You know, it could be software, but now if we're thinking more broadly about, you know, other scientific artifacts, these principles of now allowing, you know, anybody in the world to be able to to pick up and build on ideas, I think, is something that is is really powerful. And, you know, it's starting to shift how we share science. And so that includes, um, you know, publications. And so I think things like preprint servers, for example, you'll see archive are a great example of being able to, you know, get content out there. More and more journals now have open access options or, or sort of open access uh, flares to them. But I think uh, as a part of this, it's like part of the shift that I see that's needing to happen is to actually think about and sort of re uh, envision perhaps what we think the job of a scientist is and like what scientists should be doing. And it's interesting if you look up like what is a scientist, you'll like see the definitions of the person who does science. And it's like, okay, well, <laughs> that that's helpful. But you know, if you if you look at the what is science, we're starting to talk about then, you know, the pursuit the pursuit and application of knowledge and understanding of the world. And so we've often disseminated that through papers. And that is a very, you know, that that's a valuable thing to do is to capture, to write down what you've learned um, and being able to send that out to the world. 
But I think there's now so much more that we can add to the portfolio of what a scientist, you know, can share. I think software is an important piece of that is it's a new way to communicate ideas and in a very actionable way, right? As somebody can actually pick up the function that you wrote and actually do something new with that. Um, so I think that this shift in sort of this, what, what is the, you know, portfolio of a, a modern day scientist and, and what, what, what are the things that we should be producing as scientists, I think, are some of the next questions that I'm, I'm really excited to see what people come up with. And I think there's a lot of space to be very creative here, um, which I think is, is going to be fun. Yeah, there's nothing more root than what is a scientist's role. Uh, yeah, that's really getting to the core there. You know, when, when you, we've talked a lot about code, data, I feel like really things that you can, you can't really grasp them, but it's like, object, you can just like understand what it means by taking this, reproducing it which we don't have time to go into it, but I do, you know, you hear about this reproducibility crisis in science, like this addresses that uh, significantly if you could just take it. Is there something though, other than those aspects of the data, the code that you want people to understand can also be open source, open access that they just may not immediately think of? Yeah, I mean, I guess, so being able to share data and code, I think one of the important things in this space too is being able to share it in a way that like the scientific record recognizes. And so for example, being able to get DOIs for software, for data, there's now a lot of, um, there's resources like Zenodo, um, Figshare and others where you there's more flexibility around things that you can produce with a, a DOI. There's a lot perhaps of like smaller scientific artifacts that would are interesting to start to think about. I know, how do we make these things citable? So smaller articles, you know, your presentations and, and things like that. Um, so Rowan's next uh, initiative, he's been working on um, a company called CurveNote and doing some really interesting things, exploring, you know, what can be done in the publishing space to kind of modernize and include things like code, things like perhaps interactive figures um, and be able to have those things shared broadly with the the community, I think is really quite interesting. Before I get to the the final, more general question, is there anything I should have asked that I did not? I guess like one of the things that I think would be that I want, want to sort of share and communicate through this too, is that there there's a lot of like technology and lingo around open source and open science, and it can feel really intimidating. And I, I don't, Like, I think that's not the point is that really the point is, is really trying to be able to take what you've learned and being able to share that with the world. And there's so many people who are enthusiastic about trying to help support the open science movement. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of resources out there, but at the end of the day, sort of the simplest things and like being able to come back to asking, you know, are you participating in, in open science? I think if you're making pieces of your work available and and doing your best to you know make sure that things are are reproducible, people can access and and build upon what you've done. Like those are valuable contributions to open sciences. You don't have to have a you know a mastery of GitHub and Git is not is not a prerequisite uh, to participating in this. That's a, a lovely place to to end that part of the discussion. Little word of encouragement. I like that a lot. So lastly here, Lindsay, if you had to describe your journey in one word up to this point, what would it be and why? So the theme that kind of came to mind, especially in in thinking about the context of this paper and this whole discussion is um, building building blocks. And is that, you know, I think that is we talk about pursuing a scientific question, especially in in physics and, and geophysics, where we're in these natural sciences, we're trying to understand pieces of the world and we we try and go back to understanding, okay, what are the building blocks that we need to understand a problem, a, a method? Thinking about, you know, the impacts and part of the, where I, where I think Zimpeg has been quite an, impactful is this like modular building block style of how we built that is, you know, thinking about, okay, what are the, what are the components um, and how can we enable people to be able to play with those and interchange them um, and, and build up new and interesting things. And I think now, you know, as I'm working with a research group and and have some really awesome graduate students and, and postdocs and research associates, I have the pleasure of working with, 
I think also thinking about, you know, how we're creating space for each person to build their pieces and their, their contributions to science. And I think a big part of my role now is to help create that space and help position their work in this broader landscape of science and of our, our community. And so I think that's perhaps a, a theme that <laughs> maybe seems fitting here. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, well, Lindsay, I appreciate your time on this. Thanks for submitting a, another paper to the leading edge and look forward to what happens over the next few years with your projects. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Seismic Sound Off. SEG creates these episodes to celebrate and inspire the geophysicists of today and tomorrow. Visit seg.org to learn more. Email the show at podcast at seg.org. This episode was hosted, edited, and produced by me, Andrew Gary, at Treasure Mint. The SEG podcast team is Jennifer Cobb, Kathy Gamble, and Allie McGinnis. The podcast will return next week with a new episode. Until then, this is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off.